everyone. Why don't you go ahead and find your way in for some seats? I know some of the ones that come in in the next five or ten minutes will be trying to find them too, so mark your place. Will you stand with me? I want to welcome you this morning. My name is Tony Nichols. I'm the senior pastor here at Church Alive in Bentonville, and we're glad that you've come to worship Jesus with us today. We're going to just welcome the Holy Spirit, and as we worship, would you be sensitive if the Holy Spirit wants to speak or, or minister or release something through you for the benefit of the body? We just want you to be able to receive and step into that. So glad that you're here this morning. We begin our new children's ministry, and uh, when we get to that place, Misha will give a little bit of instruction and then uh, pray and lead the kids over, but it's going to be a great day. Amen? Amen. So let's pray. Will you tune, tune your heart to the Lord and will you welcome the Holy Spirit with me? Father, I thank you that before the foundations of the earth, that you, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit made provision that if we should sin, the Lamb had been slain before the foundations of the earth. And we thank you, Jesus, for our salvation, for the reconciliation with the Father and you. And when you ascended, you said, I will not leave you alone. I will send you another helper, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place today. We love you and want you. We need you. And we welcome you to be who you are and do what you want to do. Now, as we enter into a time of celebration, praise, and worship, um, would you help us, Holy Spirit, as we tune our hearts. And Jesus, I just know who you are. As we really love you, you are so moved, you can't help yourself but to pour back. And we just welcome that this morning. To you be honor and glory and great benefit be to this people. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's praise and worship. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who 
for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory.
6, or Daniel 7, verse 9. Uh, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him ten times, or ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him seated, the books were open. In Revelation 1, 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, his, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. Yes. This next song is about getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. It feels like it's getting closer. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but oh, I just can't wait. Doesn't mean we just sit here and only wait, but have to be ready. Their lamps trimmed, oils filled. So let's Chris, sing the song together. Chris, can I share something oh, real yeah. quick? Go for it. Um, I was reading in First Samuel about a lady named Hannah who um, had a husband and wanted a child and didn't have one. And she went to the temple and prayed. And um, Eli heard her and thought she was drunk. And she said, I, I'm not I'm pouring my soul out to the Lord. And later it says that the Lord remembered her and she named her child that she had Samuel, which means heard of God. So he hears us and that encouraged me. Mm. So he hears you as well. with 
every creed and tribe and tongue declaring in unity like the roar of many waters like the sound Till the whole world hears it, we'll sing till the whole world knows. King Jesus is faithful, he is the blessed hope. We'll shout till the whole world hears it, we'll sing till the whole world knows. King Jesus is faithful, he is the blessed hope. We'll shout till the whole world hears it, we'll sing till the whole world knows. The blessed hope, like the roar of many waters, like the sound. Shout to the whole world, he's it. We'll sing to the whole world, knows King Jesus is faithful, he is the blessed King Jesus. King Jesus is faithful, he is the blessed King Jesus. King Jesus is faithful, he is the blessed hope. Like the sound roar of many sound of rolling thunder hallelujah give him glory for the marriage of the lamb is coming we're getting ready getting ready God getting ready when we to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we will sing and shout the victory when we all when we all get to heaven what a day Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory.
out on what's going to happen. just kept mulling over in my mind. It says, if anyone takes away from the word of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away the part from the book of life from this holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. And John adds a good one here. He says, even as even so come, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. See his mark, it's all, baby, for you all. Uh, amen. 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 It is good. Well, let's prepare our hearts. We're going to share communion and the Lord's table together. We can have the lights. As we get ready to do this, I, I want to share just an illustration. If you are here this morning and you have not received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time. Today is that acceptable time to receive Christ. Sometimes children begin to come to a more mature understanding. Here's what I want you to remember. In the book of Revelation chapter 20, there's a bit of a library in heaven. I don't know if you knew that or not. But it talks about how there's a book in there, and each one of those, uh, each one of our names is written on the spine of one of those books. It's the record book of our life. And for the sake of the illustration, what's in those books, if you will, is written in pencil, so to speak. And yet a day comes, if we have not been born again and received Christ, that that book will become permanent record and will be judged according to whatever we've said, thought, or done. Now, God's standard is perfection. Not just good or maybe quite good, but His standard is perfection. And not a one of us here is perfect. We've been born with a sin nature. Nobody had to teach us to sin. We knew how to sin. We missed the mark and we fell short. But you see, when Jesus came, He went about everywhere showing people the perfect picture of who the Father is. He went about everywhere doing good, healing the sick, casting out the demons, forgiving sin and making people whole. And a day came when he was the revealed Messiah. And he not only died on the cross, but he became our sin and died on the cross. So that our sin is put to death. So that death and separation from God has been put to death. When he descended into the depths, it says the gates of hell could not withhold him. Those are not offensive weapons. He burst through the resistance of the enemy and deposited sin and death and separation, sickness, bondage, took the keys of sin and death that held us in bondage, rose from the dead, appeared to more than 540, ascended on high, and he ever lives. He's praying for us right now. But here's what happens. If that book is opened and you and I have been pretty good people and we only sin three times a day, we have one little thought we shouldn't have, we say one little thing we shouldn't say, maybe we do one little thing we shouldn't do. For most of us, that's a pretty good day. But 365 days a year times three, oh, let's be generous and just round it off to a thousand sins a year if we're good. Now, I'm not far from 63. So if I have been a good man, I've only committed 63,000 sins. Wow. Yes, thank you, Kirk. You're, you're such a blessing, brother. So here's the truth. None of us can earn it or deserve it. But what we're celebrating here this morning is that when we truly repent, it isn't just about 
say this prayer, I'm going to heaven, I can live however I want to. The gospel is about godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. It is a sorrow of sin and separation from God. It is a sorrow that I've gone my own way and it has not worked out well. And there's separation and there's pain and there's grief. But the good news is Jesus said, I'll take that for you, defeated that, rose and said, for everyone that there's godly sorrow and repentance, repentance, metanoia means that I see in my heart and my mind my sin and selfishness and separation. I come and I plead, Jesus, would you forgive me and cleanse me and rescue me, save me. That's really what the Word talks about. And I ask you to come in to, to, to be my new Lord and Savior. That's being born of the Spirit. It's a new life. Now listen, when a person comes to Christ and they make that decision, change happens in their life. It may not be completely overnight, but they have a new desire to follow the Lord, a new way of thinking. As we read the Word, that becomes uh, what governs our lives, not trying to fit in with the world and go to church on Sunday. It's a radically new life that's given us in Jesus Christ. And when you do that, here's the good news. That record book of sin is thrown away. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. My 75,000 sins, Kirk, has been thrown away. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But what is so good is that you're added to what's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And I wonder something. I can't really prove this, but it's as though the ink in that pen is the blood of Jesus. The blood that can never be erased and will never pass away. He gave his life, and that's what the cup is about this morning. And one day, it says that when we stand before God, the throne, the great white throne, is not where you want to stand. That's the throne of judgment where you'll be cast into hell. But if you know Jesus, to the right of the Father is the throne, the Bema seat, where your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And there's tremendous reward that will be given for faithfulness. But what the Lord is saying is, don't just wait till then. I'm reconciling you in relationship with God now. Because that's really what salvation is. It's not only forgiveness and cleansing. You can have a relationship day by day, hour by hour with the Lord right now. And learn to live His way, not the way of the world. And so that's what we're celebrating this morning. But what I want you to do is bow your head just for a moment. And if you have never repented and trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and you're ready to do that right now, We're not talking about churchianity or going through the motions. I prayed this prayer, never repented. None of that is salvation. We're talking about this sorrow that says, I've sinned. I want to leave behind my my past, my self-centered life, my my wrestle with being good one day and living for sin and myself the next day. I want Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. If you've never done that and you'd like to do that right now, just slip your hand up. Let me see you. I'll nod at you. We'll pray with you as a congregation and assist you into the beginning of this new relationship with God through your faith in what Christ has done. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? And then you can join us in the celebration of this table. Anyone? So Lord, for the rest of us, we are so excited just to remember you. We remember what you have done And we put our faith in your finished work. But Jesus, as we renew our commitment to you in the covenant today, I thank you that we overcome him, Satan, by your blood, Jesus, and the word of our testimony. Even if we love not our lives to death, life cannot separate us and death cannot separate us because we are with you now forever, no matter what. Lord, as we look at this body in many pieces this morning, Would you bring your body together in your unity? We sang it. May that be our reality as we see that you have called us to function together, not apart. And would you keep building this church and this body in strength? We are thankful, Lord, for this table. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to ask Bud and Deb if they would come and help me pass these elements. And what you'll find are two cups in one. The bottom cup has the bread in it. 
Top Cup has the juice, and we'll take together in just a moment. Mm. Thank you, Lord. If you're with us there at home, and uh, you saw my email, maybe you're ready and prepared for this. If you perhaps didn't, you have a moment to uh, grab a cracker and something that would represent the blood of Jesus. And we just want to welcome you to join us and do this together. Now, Lord, I want to pray as they're passing this out for Sharon Davis this morning as she's battling some kind of fever and nausea and things. Would you touch and heal her body? And Lord, I bring before you um, some of the people that we know um, from Rwanda that went to India for a kidney transplant and they have tested positive for COVID. Lord, for Emmanuel and his two daughters, the one who needs and the one who's giving, would you radically heal them and make a way for this transplant? And Lord, as Safraz and Dr. TV sent me the information today from Pakistan as COVID is just running rampant, Lord, we say no in the name of Jesus to the spread of this in Pakistan. Lord, instead of COVID being spread, I thank you for the, the 50 men and women that I know aggressively spreading the gospel. May the gospel spread in Pakistan. Death to COVID, yes. life and anointing to the spreading of your gospel in Pakistan. Lord, bring in your Pakistani church. Lord, would you help us really pray for neighbors and friends and people where we work that we would understand that it's not enough to just try to live well. You want us to speak the truth to these people around us. So, Lord, I'm so grateful for the body and the blood of Jesus as we partake together. We'll wait just a minute. You need one? Oh. Go ahead. Put one down there. Thank you. And she was healed. So the truth is the Holy Spirit fits in anybody. And I just want to encourage the kids, as you've heard this morning, and I'm so glad that our church will let a child who has received Jesus receive communion Amen. too. But just be, beware that, that what you and your family learn and express of Jesus is for you to express and learn and share too. Bless you. Amen. You put it down. Thank you. The body of Christ. Broken for us that we could come together. Ephesians 4.16, that the Lord is bringing together at that which every joint, every relationship supplies so the body can build herself up in love. Take together. the blood of Jesus. There's this theological word called efficacy, and it just means all-powerful, all-cleansing work of God. The blood has done it all. The cross has accomplished. And when he rose, he proved it is so. The blood of Jesus that cleanse, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus that defeats the enemy and releases healing. 
we say yes, take together. Lord, thank you for who you are and what you've done. And that it isn't just religious here today, but as we walk out these doors and who knows in a few minutes, you're in us and go with us. And Lord, as Gary and I were talking this week, we are a revival individually. If we're going to see revival, it's because we're living for you and we're speaking for you and we're ministering in your power. And people get touched and they come. We just say thanks, Jesus, for what you have planned today and this week. May you be glorified and many people be blessed. In your name, Jesus, amen. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to start these around on each side. And uh, we've got some quick announcements and things, but if you want to start that, and Erica, just you have something? Later. Later. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to start this over here if you want to put these in. Thank you. I'll come this way. Just pass it behind you there, Gary. That's fine. So let me just remind you, uh, in the life of this little church, things are meaningfully busy. And I uh, encourage you to go online and uh, look at the announcements and the things that are there, as well as these communiques are available when you walk in the door. So if you go online, you can go to the tab that has events, and it will give you the calendar of what's happening. Uh, men's group happens on, I don't need that. Men's group happens on Monday nights uh, at Workman's Cafe. We meet at 5.30 to eat, 6 o'clock. We start a DVD called Frequency. And it's about tuning in and hearing God. And it's been really encouraging as a group of men are learning to hear the Lord regularly in their daily life. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's not exclusive. Each teaching is self-contained. So guys, if you haven't been there and you want to come, it's uh, tomorrow night at, at exit 78 off of I-49, Workman's Cafe, truck stop. And we're in a place called the Razorback Room. I want to also remind you that, ladies, this Wednesday is your sister 6811, Psalm 6811. Uh, meeting here, and also uh, this Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. So Mission and I will be here at 6 a.m. putting coffee on. We're going to have fruit and some muffins. We'll have juice and some water. If a couple of you want to help us get here at 6 a.m. Thursday morning, you know what that means? It means you have to get up at 5. Just, just saying. If you get up at 515, you, you may forget and come in your jammies, but come anyway. But anyway, we will start prayer at 7 uh, virtually. The uh, uh, mayor's office here in Bentonville has included us. And then we will also, after we pray 7 to 8, invite people to join us at the Bentonville Square from 4 to 6. There'll be praise and worship, a little bit of sharing, and then we're going to prayer walk about eight different places governmentally and uh, significantly for our region uh, around the Bentonville area. Bible journaling class. Jess, where are you? I'm going to make you stand. So this is Jess Sinti, and she is starting a Bible journaling ministry this coming Saturday, 10 a.m. to noon. And if you have more uh, interest in details, would you talk to her? And then next Sunday is Mother's Day. I hope we honor them more than one day a year. But do something special for your moms next Sunday. We'll have something special for them as well. All right, a week from this coming Friday, May 14th, is the upcoming Praise and Prayer Night, 7 to 8.30 right here. Come, bring friends. We're inviting another church or two. And uh, let's pray and continue to press in for what God's doing here in this area. Misha's going to come and share a little bit about children, and then we'll dismiss them. And Oh, yeah, you know. I forget. We've got to take up the tithes and offerings. So, You know, you're all so generous and faithful. I, I don't think about money. A lot of churches, they struggle with that. You guys are amazing. I mean, you push us over the top with your faithfulness, but let's just thank the Lord, and we'll start these buckets. Father, we are grateful. Would you just continue to rebuke the devourer and open the windows of heaven and pour out? And Lord, as we have lease next door, would you move in our hearts to just give a little extra? We talked about that. And Lord, as we start that uh, lease fund we are asking that you would build up an extra $12,000 above our normal tithes to help supplement that over the next year as we grow into that with uh, ministry and things not suffer. So thank you, Lord, for how good you are to us. Amen. You can just start those buckets across. Yes, please. 
I just have a few uh, uh, things that I want to share with you about uh, the children's ministry, the new, the new thing that's going on. We've, uh, we have been doing something for our children all along, but this is a, a, a new type of schedule and uh, just a l new format. Uh, just to let you know that when uh, your children go over initially, they're all together in that back room for about 15 minutes, and we're going to have a time of, of singing and just getting the wiggles out and uh, a few just things uh, to, to do there. Uh, then they'll go to their individual class, their class appropriate, their age appropriate classes that will um, take about 20 to 25 minutes, depending on how long this guy goes. So, uh, and then for two Sundays, we're gonna concentrate on a particular lesson that, the, that our curriculum has. And then the third Sunday with the, these children, we're gonna practice and teach and mentor listening to the Holy Spirit. Their class time will be strictly being quiet before the Lord and, and, and I know what you're thinking, how can you expect three-year-olds to be quiet before the Lord? It can be done. It shall be done. <laughs> 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 and uh, and it, it, uh, it just is going to take some practice. So uh, we as teachers are committed to doing this ourselves because we can't give what we don't have. So we're committed to doing this ourselves in our own personal time, and we're gonna teach them how to just listen for the Holy Spirit. And even the littles are gonna be drawing what they hear. They're gonna be ta ta telling us what they hear. It's going to be uh, a work in progress, but this is where our revival is gonna start, okay? It really yeah. is. So yeah. let me introduce our teachers just very briefly. Crystal McNutt and Andrea Benson, Paxton Deering and Pearson Wright. Will you stand? These are our teachers and our helpers for the three-year-old through pre-K. Okay? Now, we do a three-week rotation, three weeks on, three, and then six weeks off. Right now, we don't have a third rotation. So what will happen is your kids will be with us for six weeks, and then for three weeks, they'll be over here. So I'm just trying to tease you into thinking, you know, maybe I want to get in on what's going on over there. And if your heart uh, can even give us one week out of that three-week rotation that we, doesn't, that we don't have teachers yet, please come see me or Teresa Kaufman. Where are you, Teresa? Somewhere. Okay. So speaking of Teresa, stand. <laughs> and myself and um, Solomon Rockwell, who's not here today, uh, but we are your teachers for the uh, K kindergarten through second grade. And thank yeah. you. Now, um, Teresa and I um, have decided this was what the Lord told us. And, and so it's, it's, this is strictly for this class right now. We would like to have another rotation with us. But, be, but because this is in our hearts, we're going to do three weeks on, three weeks off. Because Teresa and I used to do a month on and month off. This, isn't the three, this is no big deal for us, but we feel like this is what we're supposed to do. But again, if that age group is something that stirs your heart, please come see us. Um, Laura and Mariella Vesquez, please stand. Elaine Deaton, Leora Deering, Bailey Easterling, and Joanna Rockwell. Who's, who's not here today. These are your teachers and helpers for third through fifth grade. Or sixth grade. Sixth, sixth grade. grade. Sixth, sixth grade. grade. Yeah. yeah. And we actually have another person that is really, really interested and will join us later in the summer for this age group. So we are blessed beyond for this age group. And I think that's, that's, that really is something of, that the Holy Spirit is going to show us later what he's going to do in there. So... Right now, we will, we will dismiss our children. Uh, we will go over there. Um, and parents, we will not release your children unless you come get them. This is a safety issue because we are not connected right now, building the building. You have to go outside, and we don't want them even walking on the sidewalk by themselves. And you can just, I think you can understand why. So it doesn't have to be both parents, please. But uh, you'll come get your children. 
And uh, when you come to get your kids, look for the room that uh, your that uh, class-wise that your kid will be in. And we've got nice signs that Jess helped us that she made, and we laminated, got their names on it, so you'll know where to find your children. And um, and then get ready to for the teacher to hand you. A, a, a child registration little half sheet that's all we need from you and um, please fill that out as soon as you can and get it back to either myself or Teresa Kaufman um, so that that's about it right now there'll be more to come I'm sure and um, Erica um, Sturgeon said she felt like the Lord wanted her to pray over the children amen. as we dismiss amen I want to share a couple of things before I pray first Andrea I want you to know that when you were saying what you said about the kids, I just felt chills all through my body and I felt like that was just from the Holy Spirit, just testifying that what you said was true. Um, but I also wanna share, um, today, this week I was reading a, um, one of our children's books with Ariella and it was about, the, it was just talking about different things that the Lord has given us. And it came, the Lord, I felt, led me to start talking through um, James 1.17 that talks about how every good and perfect gift is from, from above, from God the Father, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change, and that he's never changing. And that came up in me this morning when we, when, when uh, Pastor Tony was asking about, um, you know, has the Holy Spirit led anybody to... Um, and I was asking the Lord about that, and he reminded me, our children are a gift from the Lord. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm going to pray over this morning. Sorry. Amen. <laughs> um, Lord, I thank you for these kids, and I thank you for giving them to us as a gift, Lord. And may we steward these, these wonderful gifts that you've given us well, Lord. May we teach them that you, Heavenly Father, are never changing, Lord. And I pray that you would just bless these, ch these teachers, that you would give them wisdom with these kids, Lord. And I pray for these parents, Lord, that, that this would not be the only time they hear about Jesus and about, about God the Father and about the Holy Spirit, Lord. But this would be something that is supplemental that um, these teachers are coming alongside these parents to continue to add to um, what is already being taught at home, Lord. Um, and I pray that you would give uh, the parents strength um, as they um, continue to go through the wonderful and the hard of parenting. Um, Lord, I pray for these children that they will um, come to know you, Jesus, as their Savior, that they would be born again, Lord, that they would um, grow up to love you with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord. And Lord, that they would not... Um, as it, that they would come to know you at, at, a, at a young age and that, that they would not um, allow their age to, to, um, to stop them from doing the work that you have for them, Lord, that they would learn um, as these teachers are longing to show them and as their parents, I hope, are longing to show them as well to listen to the Holy Spirit, Lord, and that they would be, that they would uh, listen and obey, that they would be obedient, Lord, um, to what you holy spirit have to say to them lord and they would we ask that you would just cast out any fear that you would give them a, a holy boldness lord a holy boldness to follow you thank you lord amen amen all right workers and children you're dismissed up through the sixth grade the rest of you find the book of esther in your bibles Find the book of Esther, if you will. If that's not a real familiar book, uh, go to the book of Psalms and turn left a couple books. I've been doing a series called Unshakable People. How do you and I become unshakable people in these very shaken times that we live in? I started a few s series ago or a few sermons ago out of Hebrews chapter 12 where he shakes everything that can be shaken so that that which cannot be shaken will remain. And then we have looked at unshakable Noah and we've looked at unshakable David who became King David. Today I want to talk to you about Esther and Mordecai, partnership to victory. They lived in a very satanic, demonic culture 
And how was it that they were able to stand for the Lord and not be shaken in the midst of a tremendous shakedown? Let me just give you a little bit of an idea. I want to read to you a few scriptures, and I'm going to tell you the story of the book of Esther. It's uh, actually 10 chapters. If you sit down and you're an average reader, you can read the whole book in somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes. I tried to read through this book about four times this week and study some things out. But as you get a hold of this book, you'll begin to see how God strengthened and what his plan was to overcome a strategy to wipe out the Jewish nation. You've heard Mish and I talk about coming back from Rwanda and the terrible genocide that took, there, took place there in 1994. Well, let me just tell you that Satan has had a genocidal tendency toward the Jewish people since the Garden of Eden. If you look through the generations and the years, there's always someone that's been trying to wipe out the Jewish people. One of the things the Lord said um, when Adam and Eve had sinned and the Lord came and looked for Adam and Adam said, you know, the woman you gave me, she did it. And he went and talked to the woman and the woman said, the devil made me do it. It's called projection where, there, where you and I don't take responsibility for our own choices and actions. We want to blame other people. And so the Lord basically meted out some discipline. He meted out some consequences. And he said to Adam that you will be able to work the lamb, but it will uh, be, have thorns and thistles by the sweat of your brow. Um, work will be challenging. He basically said to the woman, he said, um, you will serve your husband and he will rule over you, but your desire shall be for your husband. That phrase, your desire, means your desire shall be for your husband's place. You'll want to rule over him. And then he said to the enemy, he said, the woman will crush your head and you will bruise her heel. And it's a picture of how Jesus, born of the woman, uh, was injured, if you will, in the beating and the crucifixion, but he crushed the head of the enemy. So here's what Satan has done for generation after generation. He knew that Messiah, he knew that a head crusher would be raised out of the people of God known as Israel. And so he thought, if I can just corrupt the seed, which is what he did with the watcher angels that left their domain and created the Nephilim, if I can just kill the Israeli people some way, I will prevent Messiah from coming. And that was his strategy. And now that Messiah has come, there's such hatred in the heart of the enemy, and he does not want to see Israel prosper and rebuild the temple and see the Lord come back. So he keeps trying to protract his evil by crushing the nation of Israel. What you see in the book of Esther is an instrument of the enemy trying to genocide the Jewish people again. So let me just read to you some uh, very familiar passages out of the book of Esther. I'm going to start in chapter 2 and about verse 5. I'll go back and tell the story very quickly. But I want you to see, and I'll connect the dots in a moment. It says in Esther 2 and verse 5, in, in Sushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured from Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away, and Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, her uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. She was an orphan. The young woman was lovely and beautiful, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as her, his own daughter. He was a much older cousin. Uh, my dad grew up in a family of 11 kids, and between the oldest son and the youngest son and daughters in between, there were about 23 years. So you can see an older son and his younger uh, brother or sister uh, dying, and he was like an uncle. Mordecai took care of her. Now it's interesting because you'll see in a minute she was taken in with another other virgins and possibly going to become a new queen. And so look at verse 9. Now the young woman pleased him. He, she pleased the head of the concubines and those being prepared to go before the king. And she obtained his favor, so he readily gave her beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants who provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of women. What I'd like you to do 
is to skip over, if you will, to about verse 14 of chapter 2. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of women, to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's unit, who kept the concubines. What he's talking about there is these virgins would go in, whatever they wanted to take out of the king's treasury, jewelry, all sorts of fancy things they could take. If he did not choose them as the queen, they got to keep them. And so all these young ladies were going in before the king, and the inference here is they were grabbing all they could get. They went in before the king, and he did not take pleasure in them. But there's this young girl named Esther. And she took great counsel from the head of the eunuchs over the king's um, concubines. And I want you to see at the end of 14 and following, she would not go to the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. That's these other concubines. Now, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all all the virgins, so he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. If you will, go to chapter 4, about verse 13. This is the most famous passage in the book of Esther. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do you not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews? For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days or nights, and my maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. You see, she committed civil disobedience because the command of the Lord was greater than the law. And if I perish, I perish. Most famous verse in the book of Esther. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Let me just back up a minute and tell you the story quickly of this book of Esther And there'll be some more scriptures that I want to point out. But here's what's going on. After Babylon, you're familiar with Nebuchadnezzar. And you're familiar with what God did with him as he humbled him for seven periods of time out in the field. And it dewed on him. And uh, he ate grass with the animals. And his fingernails grew like claws. And when he finally acknowledged that God was God, uh, the Lord delivered him and restored his wits. After he passed, his son Belteshazzar was a very wicked, self-centered man. And you remember God sent the finger that wrote on the wall and removed him. Then came the, the Medes, and they came in, and they began to rule over Israel and over that captivity. And after the Medes, there was an empire called the Persians. Now, this takes place from about 485 B.C. to about 464 B.C., and, and Xerxes I, you'll know him as a Hazarus, was the ruler and the king at this time. Now, this was no small rulership. He ruled from India and all across what you and I would know as Greek and Rome and all of those European countries, all the way to the, the northern top of Africa to Ethiopia. He had 127 provinces. He had seven major princes, and he had governors or satraps from every one of those provinces, and he was having a party in chapter 1. He brought them all together, and man, they were eating and feasting. He was showing off the riches of his treasury and the power of all this conquering in the Persian Empire. And this feast lasted for six months. It was a drunken orgy and a brawl. And somewhere toward the end of that, he decided that he wanted to bring his queen Vashti in. And she was known to be incredibly beautiful. And he wanted to bring her in and show her off in front of all these people. And she said, not on your life. And so he became angry, and he commanded her to come, and she wouldn't come. And so he banished her, and he asked these leaders of his, what shall I do about what she's, uh, how she's responded to me, and what shall I do about a new queen? 
And they said, well, you put her away and don't let her come before you anymore, and she's not queen, and let us go all throughout the land, and we'll find these young, beautiful virgins, and we will prepare them, and they'll come in one at a time, and you choose the next queen that you want. He said, that's a really good idea. And so that's what they did. So when you get to chapter 2, you see that they're being gathered all in, and many of these young ladies, I'm sure, are beautiful, but there's one, her name was Hadassah, and Hadassah is her Hebrew name, and her uncle Mordecai said, don't let them know that you're a Jew. There's so much prejudice against us. Don't let them know that you are from Jewish descent. Hadassah's name means myrtle. It's a beautiful, if you will, evergreen shrub that, shrub that gives off a fragrance, but it was the symbol of hope. Her name represented the hope of God for his people. But Mordecai renamed her Esther, which means bright and shining star. And she certainly is going to become that. And so she is taken in with all these other women. And back in that day, there was a one-year preparation so that you would be ready to go before the king. And they would prepare you uh, physically. They would prepare you the protocol and how you were to act and all those sorts of things. And the first six months was called the house of preparation. And you'd be taking these baths in, in myrrh and all these kind of bitter spices, and it would remove all of the toxins from you. And then the next six months would be the house of preparation where you'd be taking baths and all these perfumes, and you'd smell really good. And they would teach you how to respond and how to act. Now, in the Christian life, I want to just tell you something. Before you're going to be significantly used by the Lord, there will be the house of purification through Christ, but he'll also deal with some of the fleshly ways that we live even after we come to know Christ. And you're going to see that once we know Jesus, we're not to live for ourselves anymore, but for the will of God. And it's a challenge because we know that and we live a little bit and then we slip back to the flesh and we start living for the Lord, but I want my own way. It's a battle we all face. But as you and I learn to shed and die daily to the flesh, then the house of preparation comes and the fragrance, if you will, of the Lord comes upon our life. And that's what's happening to Esther. Now Mordecai would come each day. He sat at the gates. Her cousin that was like an uh, uh, uncle to her was one of the people at the city gates and he had a lot of authority. And he would make decisions for Sushan and for the people uh, there in the city. And so he would come by each day and he would check and make sure she was all right. He had equipped her filled with the truth of God and the character. She was a woman of character as well as beauty. And the time came for Esther to go in and to spend her one night with the king. And when she went in, she was dressed probably more simple and elegant. Um, she, some said, would only take a little bit of jewelry. And if she was going to become queen, it wasn't going to be because of her greed or all of this extra things on the outside. She was going to be a woman of God's presence. She was going to be a woman of character and somebody that he loved because of who she was. And she went in, and the king was pleased. She took wise counsel. And the king was pleased, and he loved her more than all the others that had come before him. And he said, this is my new queen. And he put the crown on her head, and then he threw a party for several days to celebrate his new queen. Well, what's happening is, as she's getting settled in as the new queen, Mordecai is at the city gates, and he hears a couple of these eunuchs that are high up in the king's service, and they have plotted against him to do the king harm. Mordecai hears the word. He has connections with the queen. He said, would you please go tell the king that these two men are wanting to annihilate him. They're wanting to do harm to him. And he better guard himself and check this out. Sure enough, they were there to do him harm. And these two men were captured and hanged. And it was written down in the Chronicles of the Persians. That will become really significant in a moment. Time goes on, and Haman, and his name means noise and tumult. He's a man that stirs things up. He's a man of violence. He, he's a self-centered man, and yet he has wormed his way into the favor of the king. And Haman has come before the king, and he's procured this favor. And the king has said when he goes throughout the city that people need to pay homage. But when he would go by Mordecai, Mordecai would not bow down to him. Mordecai would not honor the wickedness of this man Haman. And so it made Haman really angry. 
And so Haman decided that he would not make a, a public display because he knew Mordecai had some influence. But what he decided to do was to go before King Ahasuerus and say, there's a group of people that live in these 127 provinces. There are these people called Jews and they worship a different God and they don't obey your laws. And let's make a law uh, about a year from now. They drew lots. That's what per means. And, and let's make a law and have it written and delivered all these places on the 13th day of the 12th month that we're going to annihilate all the Jews. We're going to kill them all in one day. Genocide. And the king said, well, if that's so, and he said, and king, by the way, I'll put 10,000 talents of silver into your treasury to pay for all of this. And the king said, well, that's a good idea. So he stamps it with his signet ring, and that law cannot be broken unless the king changes it. And Mordecai hears this word and he tears his garment and the Jewish people are in a turmoil and they begin to cry out to the Lord. They don't know what they're going to do. And Mordecai gets a word to Esther. And he says, Esther, this is what's going on. She said, well, I, it just can't be. And so he gets the documents to her and she reads and she is terrified. And, and she's like, well, well, I don't know what to do. All my people are going to be uh, put to death, but the king favors me. And Mordecai says, don't think that once they discover that you're a Jewish, that you're a Jewish lady, that you will escape any more than the rest of the Jewish people. And then Mordecai gives her a piece of advice. He said, what I encourage you to do is to pray. And she called the intercessors and, the, and people, and they fasted and prayed for three days. And he said, and you dress up and you go before the king. And if he tips his scepter to you, then you have favor. Go before the king and plead your case. Now, if Esther had dressed up and, and gone before the king without an appointment, if he did not tip his scepter in favor, she'd be put to death. And that's why she made the statement Perhaps God has designed me for such a day as this. Can I give you a definition for destiny? Destiny is when you and I fulfill the purpose for which God made us. Not the world's opinion, but the purpose for which God made us. And she said, well, I will go before the king. Perhaps he has prepared me sovereignly for a day such as this. And she said, you guys pray, and I'm going to do it. And if I perish, I perish. I would rather give my life in doing the will of God and living for the benefit of others than to live in my personal safety and my personal prestige and my personal wealth while the rest of my people are put to death. And so the day comes when she is dressed in that robe and she goes before the king, and he tips the scepter. Now, something's happening while this is going on. She comes before the king. She's reading from the accounts. And this, book, this man, Haman, is really evil and wicked. And because Mordecai wouldn't bow down, he went and said, let's annihilate the Jews. But God had a purpose to rescue them. And so while he is uh, asking his people to build these gallows 50 feet high, he's going to hang Mordecai the next day. Esther goes before the king, and she says, um, I want to throw a banquet. It's a banquet of wine. And I look at that, and I think, what's that about? I want you, king, to be in a good mood. I want you to be relaxed and happy because I have a request of you. And so the king says, well, that's great. And she said, and I want one other person there, Haman. So the king's going to uh, invite Haman. But in the meantime, the king reads this record of Mordecai saving his life. And he said, what's been done for this man, Mordecai, for saving my life and, and being such a good servant of mine? And they said, nothing. And he said, well, who's in the outer court? Which one of my leaders in the outer court? And it was Haman. He brought Haman in. He said, what should I do for a man that is very special to me? He has saved my life. And Haman thought he was speaking of himself. He said, well, you ought to put a, a robe on that the king's worn. And you ought to give him one of your choice horses that has the insignia on the forehead. And you ought to parade him throughout the streets and say, this is the favor and the blessing and how the king feels about a man who serves him. And, and Haman thought, this is about me. And the king said, no, this is about Mordecai. And Haman, you go out and you saddle the horse and you tell Mordecai and you lead him through all the streets of the city and tell him this is how the king treats somebody that he favors. And Haman was put to shame. And he went through the streets, and he did this, and he was angry, and he was bitter. And then when he was done, he went home in mourning and said to his wife and his servants, what am I going to do? And they're like, you got the gallows ready. This man is going to usurp you. You better take care of him. But before he could do anything, they got him. 
and they brought him to Esther's banquet. And he's there, and Esther's talking and sharing, and he says, what, what would you have me do for you up to half the kingdom? He's pretty taken with this woman. That's only like, you know, 63 or 64 provinces and riches that you and I cannot imagine and power and authority and all this. And she's like, that's not what I'm after. And she says, if I've really found favor in your sight, would you come once again tomorrow and I will tell you what I want? He says, sure. And so the next day, Haman is there. She says to the king, she said, what I really want is there's a man on your main leadership staff that hates my people, and he has sent out an edict to annihilate them on the 13th day of the 12th month. And she said, and I would like that to be taken care of and reversed. And he says to her, who is this man? And she says, that wicked Haman right there. And the king is so angry that he walks out to his garden. Haman knows he's in trouble. And so while the king is out trying to cool down and get his wits, Haman literally comes and pleads for his life from Queen Esther, and he literally falls on her on the couch pleading for his life. The king comes back in, and he thinks Haman is there to try to take advantage of her right in his presence. And he said, I've had enough of him and enough of this. They put a hood on his head, and the very gallows that he built for Mordecai, they took him out and they hanged him. And he said, Esther, what do you want me to do? He took the signet ring off of Haman's hand and he gave it to her. And she said, I would like to promote Mordecai who's been faithful. And I would like them to send an edict out through all of your provinces to stop the annihilation of my people. But king, it'll take an order from you. And King Ahasuerus said, let it be done, let it be so. And Mordecai was promoted to literally second in the nation. And God went from this man who was humble and this young lady who was an orphan, and he delivered his people. And later, all the sons of Haman, the ten sons of Haman, were hanged as well. And God did away with his enemies of his people in the Persian Empire. Isn't that a great story? Let me tell you, it's a true story. And there's some allegory there. Mordecai, his name means, if you will, little man or counselor. And he's a picture of the Holy Spirit of sorts, if I can put it that way. Basically, speaking into the life of Esther, God's hope and God's plan, and they're in partnership. We know who Haman is. He's the instrument of Satan. He's the instrument of the enemy that wants to kill God's people. The king, if you will, is the world system and the influence that we can have on the people and government and the world system if we will walk with God in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what we see the Lord doing is promoting the Holy Spirit to be the second in command as he partners with us in the land. It's a tremendous story. There's some truths that we can learn. I want to give you five of them quickly. And I'm just trying to be careful a little bit of our time. But let me give you five truths from the lives of Mordecai and Esther. If you grab the teaching sheet coming in, these are on there. If not, let me just speak them to you quickly. The first truth, if you're going to partner to victory with the Holy Spirit and other people in the body of Christ, how many of you know we're not called to live this Christian life as an, as an island. We're not really called to do this alone. You see, the, one of the reasons that we have small groups of all kinds and we're building these relationships, we want community here at Church Alive because we absolutely are going to need each other now and in the days ahead. And so what Mordecai was able to do in the life of Esther was selfless compassion. Mordecai was compassionate to the needs of others and he raised Esther to be the same. She's an orphan girl with no rights or standing in society, but Mordecai, her older cousin, raised her into a lady of character and compassion, and a day came when that teaching paid off. Now, just for fun, you can Google famous, well-known people that were adopted. I did that this week, and about 23 people came up. Babe Ruth was adopted. How many of you knew that? Marilyn Monroe was adopted. Again, I may not always agree with these people's lifestyle, but I'm headed somewhere. Gerald Ford was adopted. Eleanor Roosevelt and Nancy Reagan were adopted. 
Bill Clinton was adopted. Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's, was adopted. We're going to camp out there for just a moment. So his mother died. His dad abandoned him. His grandmother, if you will, picked him up, and she raised him, and she taught him how to be a godly man, a man of character. He, he became interested in the food service business, and he tried two or three restaurants, and he was uh, fired because of his inabilities and uh, some of the other things. But as he became 16 or 17, he became very skilled in the restaurant business, and C Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken took him on, and he became successful. He sold him a franchise or two. Later, he sold those to get the money to start Wendy's. Now, how many of you know Wendy's has square meat in their hamburgers? Do you know why? I didn't know this till this week. His grandmother said, in life, walking with the Lord, in business, if you want to be successful, never cut corners. And so, that square hamburger is his life message. Whatever you do with integrity, do it with high quality and never cut corners. As he became successful, and that franchise grew and grew, in the midst of that blessing, he started an adoption agency. And it's not so much now, but I remember back in the 80s and 90s, you'd walk into a, a Wendy's, and they're plastered all over the wall, and they're just picture after picture of these children through his adoption agency that ha had been adopted. As a matter of fact, from the time he started the agency until he died, there were over 30,000 kids in the United States adopted through his agency. I want to say something to you. Some of you maybe have been adopted. Some of you maybe have come from a background um, like that, and it doesn't limit the Lord whatsoever from using you. Because your identity is your new creation in Christ. Old things pass away, and you can rise up and become whatever God wants you to be if you'll step into it. Mordecai had selfless compassion. Dave Thomas was another example in the days we've lived in. The second thing I want you to get is wisdom and understanding. Mordecai had God's wisdom and understanding. When he heard that there was a genocide um, command to kill his people, he began to fast, to pray, to put on sackcloth and ashes, what they did back then. And he cried out to God and he said, I don't understand, but he said, I know you're God and I need your wisdom. What do we do? And the Lord began to show him. And he had prepared Esther, and she had wise counsel. And she took that counsel, and she prepared to meet the king. And that ability allowed her elegance and her character to catch the heart of the king, and she was made queen. She had wisdom and understanding. Let me just point you to something. I don't have time to turn there this morning, but in Proverbs chapter 30, there are these little verses. There are four things that are exceedingly small and very wise, and it talks about ants, and it talks about the little rock badgers, and it talks about the locusts that fly and literally cover the sky and block out the sun, and the fourth thing are these little lizards that live in king's palaces. Any of you ever remember reading that scripture? Here's what that's talking about. The ants are about preparation. The coney badgers have this alarm that goes off if an enemy comes into their colony, and that's about uh, protection, how they partner together for protection. The locusts fly, and they don't seem to have a leader, but they literally control the airspace. And as believers in these days we live in, we're going to have to learn to pray and intercede and control the airspace. But the fourth little creature, the lizard, is about penetration. Because the lizard is humble and small, it can go through cracks and under little doorways right into the presence of the king. Can I just suggest to you that Esther was like a lizard? She was this humble orphan girl that was able, because of her demeanor and her character, her wisdom and understanding, to stand before the king of the greatest empire of the earth at that time and able to influence his heart. She didn't get there because of pride. She got there because of humility. So the second truth, wisdom and understanding. I met a young lady in Mongolia a number of years. When I was there, her name was Nora. She was a beauty queen, stunning, famous. She had been on Larry King Live. She was wealthy, 
and people had encouraged her um, to do a number of things that she could have become absolutely wealthy and famous, but she said, no, that's not uh, who I am. She had come to Christ about five years before. Her husband uh, now lived in the U.S. at that time, and they were separated. They had a little boy, and uh, he was uh, in Raytheon, and they were, he was involved in government missiles and all those sorts of things. And she had come to Christ, and she was actually on the prime minister's cabinet. I had an opportunity to meet the prime minister of Mongolia and to meet her. And she was the head of family and human development. And what she chose to do with her life was simply this. She said, now that I've come to Christ, she said, I want to use who I am and what I am in the Lord. She'd had some great teaching. And she said, I want to reach especially the young people of Mongolia. Their crime rate in Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia, has about three and a half million people and about one and a half or, or 1.7 million live in this one city. And the crime rate was so high, about 30% of the kids were school dropouts, they were drug addicts, there was violence, there was gangs, all this sort of stuff. And she went to bat with the prime minister and with people in government with great courage until she talked the government into funding a one-year discipleship program using the Sermon on the Mount and a number of other scriptures. And they met once a week with the students, and she met once a week and her trainers with the teachers. And they ended up in all 21 government schools and their two military schools. And they were discipling about 10 to 12,000 of these youth at a time, and the government paid for it all. Yeah, wow. Now here's the good news. After a few years of that, Nora and her husband reconciled and they live today on the East Coast and they're both serving the Lord together. But she was willing to lay down her life and her beauty and her fame for the purposes of God. I didn't mention to you she had graduated from Yale as an attorney. She was one smart girl. Here's the third truth I want you to get a hold of, courage. Mordecai had courage to stand up for his beliefs. Esther had courage to lay down her life if needed. We're living in a day where mediocrity will not get it. We're going to have to have the courage to stand up for what we know to be true and to lay our lives down if that's what is required of us. How many of you remember a number of years ago that there was an uprising in China around a place called Tiananmen Square? How many of you remember the famous picture where that one young man carrying his satchel is standing in front of this tank and he stopped a tank in Tiananmen Square? It literally was the picture seen round the world. Here's what you and I, I think, have to come to. There will be times when God asks us to stand up in courage in situations that are not comfortable. But one person with the Lord can be a majority and stop and change things. Sometimes the lie of the enemy is, well, there's just not enough of us. There never will be until that one person gets started. And for a number of years, that stopped the religious persecution. Now, it has started again with a passion in China, but it stopped to a great degree for about 10 or 12 years. It was cut to a minimum because of one man who said, this isn't right, and he stopped it. That was Esther. She had courage. Here's the fourth truth I want you to get. Faith and hope. Mordecai and Esther had faith and hope in God's destiny. They said, I will trust and obey the Lord, and we will trust him to work in the hearts of the people that we influence. The king delighted in her and tipped the scepter. She took hold of it, and her humble confidence in God brought change in this country. Now, let me just say something to you. She had God's wisdom to romance the heart of the king. And she knew not to just go before him and say, Haman, blah, blah, blah. She got him in a place where he was relaxed and he was, if you will, uh, in love with her. And instead of using that influence for worldly purposes, she used that influence for the kingdom of God, for the purposes of God. So, let me just say something to you that we began to learn, Mish and I, back in the early 2000s, 2003, 4, 5. We were part of a prayer movement of ministering to the Lord, learning how to pray the Word, and learning what intimacy with God was all about. 
And we discovered something. The more intimately we grew with the Lord, the more power we had in spiritual warfare. And our intimacy with the Lord was like spiritual warfare. And when we grabbed a hold of the heart of the Lord and we were loving him and the enemy would come against us and we would cry out and say, Father, we'd say, Jesus, that authority was supplied to crush him. Can you see that that's what God used for spiritual warfare in the life of Esther? She romanced the heart of the king. Now, he's not a picture of Jesus, but our king is Jesus. And I want to tell you something. When you and I will romance the heart of our King Jesus, when we worship Him and we love Him and we spend time not just saying, give me this and I need this and forgive me of that, those are okay, but when we spend time worshiping and loving God just because we love Him, it moves His heart. And you will find that a lot of the warfare and things in your life will get more quickly crushed and out of the way because of your love for the King. And that's what happened. As she came and really loved the king, she had such influence and his heart was moved and he destroyed the enemy. And he raised up Esther and her people. Listen, I know this is a tough day that we live in, but we can learn to trust God and we can learn to have hope. Hope's not wishful thinking. It's the confident assurance. That song you sang this morning about the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, that's my new favorite song. Woo! The truth about that and what's really coming, that's not wishful thinking. Hope is confident assurance. We're going to walk through this. We're going to win some battles. Things may get a little challenging. But I used to listen to a group, and I'm a lot older than some of you, called Love Song back in the 70s and the early 80s. Some of you are not shaking your head. At the end of one of their little albums, there was this little ditty. It was only about 40 seconds, and they sang it twice, but it went something like this. We win, we win, hallelujah, we win. I took a look at the end of the book, we win. And I've never forgotten it. Because sometimes things get discouraging. But I go back to the truth of that song and the truth of Scripture. And gang, it's all worth it because we're exalting Jesus and a day comes when we are with him and we win and he has his rewards with him that's what we're living for here's the last truth I want to leave with you obedience to God Mordecai and Esther were rewarded because they did what was right in the Lord's eyes Esther said I'm not going to live for my beauty and advantage I'm going to live for the purposes of God and whatever that looks like that's what I'm going to do and as she did it, obviously God blessed and rescued a nation. So what's the application today? It's really simple. We have to recognize the times we're living in. And we have to begin to say, Lord, what are you, what are you purifying me from? What are you preparing me for? so that I will have that closeness with you, so that when I speak, there is a real release of authority, that when I pray, I see uh, the enemy moved out of the way, and I see who you are come upon people and save them or heal them or deliver them or whatever that looks like. Lord, what are you preparing me for that I might embrace my destiny? Remember, destiny is when you and I accomplish the purpose for which God made us. And if you're going to walk into that, we're going to have to be people of selfless compassion. We'll need God's wisdom and understanding. We'll need His courage, faith and hope, and obedience to God. Sometimes when you step out, it's not always immediate. How many of you have experienced that lag between your step of faith and your obedience and when God releases the answer? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Those are the times that are challenging, but because of your relationship, you hang on to the Lord and you stand. And that's what you and I are going to have to learn to do. Can't do it alone. Okay? I want you to stand. We're going we're gonna to close. These were unshakable people because they knew God and they did not live for themselves. They lived for God's purposes and they lived for others. 
one of the major principles of the scripture is called sowing and reaping. Listen, if you sow to self and live to self, you're going to just reap grief. Can you accept that? But if you will truly live for the Lord and grow daily denying and dying to that self, and you will learn to live more and more for Jesus and his purposes, then what you sow will come back to you, the goodness of God, the favor of God, the relationships that are deep and really matter, and you'll be some people that make a difference. Yeah, the world's dark, but God's light really can fix all of that. We have been said that Northwest Arkansas is a place of refuge, a place, and if you haven't noticed it, people are moving in here faster than they ever have before. And some people have been doing a little bit of a survey. Where are you coming from and why are you moving here? Did you know that the statistics are like three out of four people moving here are actually believers right now? Because they're tired of the socialism and the Marxism and the paganism and the ungodliness of places where they're living. And they've heard that this is a place worth coming to and living in. Now, if this is going to be a place of refuge, then what that means is God's going to provide, if you will, some safety and some strength. But not so we can hunker down in the bunker and say, hallelujah, we're okay, we've got ours, hell with the world. That's not where he's, that's not why he's doing this. He's asking us to grow strong so that as that tsunami of harvest comes in, we're ready to help a bunch of people get saved and grow up and be disciples and follow Jesus. And then stand before God one day and say, yep, these are my neighbors and these are the people I work with and I'd like to introduce them to you, Jesus. They love you. That's what we're called to. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for a book like Esther. As I look at that, it's one of many examples of how the enemy wants to destroy and crush the literal people of Israel and, if you will, the greater people of your kingdom. But Lord, as the scriptures came forth this morning, even as Chris shared and, and others, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and you have set up your throne, and it shall not be moved. And Lord, we have access by your doing, not because we're good. You said because of Jesus and your trust in him, you belong here. So we come before your throne this morning and we worship you and really tell you we love you. But Father, what we're asking for is this significant anointing of the Holy Spirit to live for you. Would you give us the courage and the boldness to share the gospel with people? Would you bring us people who are troubled and they begin to ask questions and start the conversation? And Lord, we don't just want to populate heaven. We want to make disciples. And as you're doing a work in Northwest Arkansas, we'd just like to be a part of that. So Lord, thank you for this people. I truly love them and you do too. And may we shed the things of the world. May we yield up our flesh and the things we trust in. And may we become prepared like Esther so that we can be pleasing to you and that we can share your influence and change the world. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Enjoy some fellowship. And please don't forget to get your kids. <laughs>